Okay, let's get right into it. Comparing the particle core plywood you're using and the veneer core plywood, which one do you think is stronger? And um, I'm wondering the reason you choose particle core plywood. Part of it is usually not a choice. It's a matter of availability. I usually buy my cabinet grade type plywoods at my local big box place and um, whatever they have in stock basically. On the whole, I would prefer to have and I would prefer to work with veneer core plywood. As for strength, yes, veneer core plywood is stronger than particle board core and it's also quite a bit more durable as in it will not fracture off like particle uh, board core will and it's just slightly less susceptible to water. Now a lot of people make a big deal about water and particle board core and it's really not warranted because if your thing is in a wet situation where the, the material can get wet, it will damage veneer core plywood just as easily as it will particle board core plywood. And the only real difference there is that the particle board core may swell, you know, get thicker, whereas the veneer core will resist that somewhat. But in no circumstances do you want to get these products uh, to the point where they're actually wet. You know, atmospheric humidity will not have any effect on these materials uh, whatsoever as far as durability is concerned. Now, whenever I mention plywood in a video and I'm talking about specifically about particle board core plywood, I get a lot of comments from people saying, well, that's not plywood. That's uh, particle board core, or that's chipboard, or that's fiberboard. Well, in the industry, you could say. See, I, t I talk from, I speak from, um, you know, being in the uh, profession, you could say. I was uh, a carpenter for a long time. I did a lot of uh, cabinet work and so on and so forth. And that's exactly what they call it in the trade, you could say in North America, and that's, you know, throughout the entire continent. That's what they call this material. Any uh, sheet stock that has a real wood veneer on both sides is called plywood, regardless of what the core is, it's still plywood. So you say maple plywood, and the core could be, could be veneer core, could be lumber core, lumber core is like big pieces of wood. It could be particle board core. It could even be OSB core. I've seen that before actually. I've seen a whole shipment of cabinets for a school and they were made from, I couldn't believe it, the plywood had OSB in the middle. But man was that stuff strong. It was incredible. There is an advantage to particle board core plywood in that it tends to stay much flatter than the veneer core. You can see it sometimes, especially in a highly uh, finished, like a glossy finish on a plywood panel, say a door or panel, wall panel, whatever. You can kind of see it wavy or undulating surface if it's a veneer core, whereas the particle board core will stay nice and flat usually. And even better than that for staying flat is an MDF core. So that's a, a very distinct advantage for that material. If you're going to be doing like wall panels or something like that, and you're going to put a, you know, a good finish on it, a good reflective finish, especially because you'll see that stuff a mile away if, <laughs> if you use veneer core plywood. Next one is from Graham Howe. Graham is a moderator on my website forum and puts out a lot of good projects. He has a YouTube channel that he occasionally puts uh, videos on. I wish he would put more. Anyway, he's got a question here. Do you apply any coating to hand tools to avoid rust? I saw you use water-based poly on the table saw, but I'm not sure that would be as practical on hand saws, planes, etc. cetera. Um, I put it on uh, my big, um, it's right there on the floor. I'm not going to get it. 
it's just right there. I don't know why it's in here, but it's there. And my framing square, my steel framing square that I've had forever. And it's about the only thing that keeps it from rusting uh, is the water-based poly. I wiped it on, I wiped it off, and it was good. Um, as for rust on tools, I generally don't do anything. I, I don't go out of my way unless it's something that I have to read, you know, like that framing square. Because, I mean, it's obviously it's useless if I can't see the numbers on my framing square and the tables if it's rusted up and you can't see through the rust. But otherwise, um, I prefer tools that actually get that uh, patina. And I'm actually gonna I'm actually gonna stop the video now and I'm gonna go out to my shop and I'm gonna get my old uh, block plane to show you what I'm talking about. Okay, I'm back and I picked up the framing square off the floor. Here's what it looks like now. I actually left it out in the rain. It got a little bit um, a little bit of surface rust on there. So it needs a new treatment, but it did it remarkably well. And all I did here with this was basically painted it on and wiped it off immediately. So it's an ultra thin coating. And that was after cleaning up with the sander to get rid of the rust. But uh, here's my block plane. My father gave me this back in, oh, it has to be 1986. So uh, is that 30 years ago? 96, 2006, yeah, yeah, 31 years ago. So I've had this thing for, it doesn't have the blade and the, the thingamadoodle in here because I took the blade out because I was trimming uh, edge banding with it. I'd say it normally uses the blade from this. And it also needs to be repaired. I got this part right here that has a piece that sticks up that goes into the back of the blade. And that's, uh, that's broken. I was going to make a new piece from steel actually complete to replace this and thought that might make an interesting video anyway so <laughs> getting back to protecting the tools i don't like it when people i can't say i don't like it it's just in my opinion it just it's a waste of time to try to keep these kinds of tools looking brand new. I would much rather this right here, you got this brownish uh, patina that is, as the thing will rust, it will, you know, you use it. And that's one of the better ways to prevent the tool from, from rusting or keep rust under control anyway, is to use it. And here on the sole, I've never done a, a thing to this to flatten it or straighten it or protect it in any way. It's got a little bit of uh, rust happening, but the first few times that you plane something down with it, that rubs off, so never an issue. Another one is my old hammer here. You know, there'd be people that would polish this up and then, you know, coat it with oil, do the same thing with the handle. I like this ham. I like this hammer just the way it is, and there's nothing I would change. This has character. This has history. And when you get out your sandpaper and you rub this down to the bare metal, and you put you know some paint on there or whatever, and then you sand down the handle, and you get rid of the parts where it broke off because you were using it to hit something and it chipped off and it flew in your face or whatever. You're getting rid of the history the, of the tool, the character of the tool. And I think that tools should be allowed to age gracefully like this. And like I say, the best way to uh, treat them right is to use them often. So that's my philosophy on rust coating tools or protecting tools. The exception to all this though would be a handsaw. Generally you want the plate of your handsaw to be as clean as you possibly can have it. That way when you're cutting something you're not leaving uh, you know a dark brown edge on the thing that you'll have to get rid of. Not, not that you're going to be using anything that's hand sawn or even table saw sawn like that to work with you you have to take it further you have to either plane it or sand it you have to smooth it in some way 
But the plate of a hand saw, I would use the same thing, water-based polyurethane, put it on thin, wipe it off. And if you see that it starts to rust, you know, get out the steel wool or whatever and bring it down, back down to the bare metal and put on another coat. Like I said, they last, that coating lasts forever. So it's not something you'd have to be doing often. Okay, next one. I'm planning to replace the aluminum top on my table saw. And I'm trying to figure out which is the best material MDF, plywood or particle board. My main concern is that it must be stable over time. And in my experience, all things uh, bend and bow structure. Besides building a good rigid structure, which would you consider the best material in this case? Of the three, I would use the best quality plywood I could find, uh, Baltic birch. But if you think that there's any material that will withstand sag or uh, bowing or deflection on its own, that's not the case. You need to add some structure there to work with the material to keep it straight. And uh, it doesn't have to be, you know, a huge amount of structure. I mean, you look at something like a torsion box type uh, construction, and I don't mean to do that here. I don't mean to build a torsion box on top of your table saw thing. What I mean is look at the structure that's in the typical torsion box and it's ribs. And you'll see the same thing actually if you take the top off your table saw, you'll see these ribs and they're not, you know, they're not massive or anything, they, but they do help to keep everything nice and straight. So thin material, if I, if I could afford it, I could find it. Quarter inch, uh, say Baltic birch plywood, or my next one would be, and this is considerably cheaper, would be a particle board, actually, half inch. I don't think you can get a quarter inch. And if you did, it would probably get too wavy just with, you know, humidity in the air. I wouldn't use MDF at all. I wouldn't even consider MDF for that. The surface of it is not durable enough. The structure of MDF is different from the other two things that are mentioned there. Plywood is a good, durable, high strength material. Particle board has the advantage of being staying nice and flat, but it also has kind of a sandwich structure in itself. Usually it's harder or denser on the outer faces than it is in the core. So that adds, you know, some strength there. But like I said, the key to building anything effectively is to add the right amount of support where you need it. I mean, if you're talking about replacing the aluminum top, I would actually just leave that on and go with the thinnest material I could find and put it right down on top of that top and go from there. And that'll be a good part of your structure right there. And it will be in a place where it needs to be. The next one is not a comment I got on a video. It's actually a message sent to me on Patreon. It's from Ken here and he asks, or he says that he has, um, what it basically says is, or what I get from the message is that he has not had a shop that is set up to work from and he wants to do that. And basically what he has is a bunch of tools that he carries around with him to do things. He's not specific about what he does, but he wants to go know from going to that to, to doing stuff at home in the workshop or setting up the workshop, where to get started. And I kind of had the same problem, you know, when I was not doing this full time. And it was because I was out, you know, during my day job and I would have all of my tools thrown in the back of my truck and I would go to a job and I would do that and I would come home. And if I wanted to do anything in my shop, which is my garage, of course, I would have to have either duplicate tools set up in there or I would have to take everything out of my truck and bring it into the shop and do stuff. And then I would have to bring it back out to the truck and put it in there. So I could never get anything organized or set up properly because it was constant motion type thing. I couldn't leave this here because I would have to take it there. And then uh, I didn't have the money to buy totally duplicate tools. So I could set up the shop to do everything there and 
have the stuff to take on the road. There will always be some back and forth. And the idea that things had to move like that actually stopped me from getting my shop organized the way I wanted it for maximum efficiency. <clears throat> I'm kind of laughing now because my shop is nowhere near uh, organized for maximum efficiency. And here I am, you know, five years after I stopped actually, you know, working uh, my day job. Anyway, to get back to the question, I would take it like this. Uh, if I were setting up a shop from scratch right now, I would build a workbench, first of all, and make it relatively simple. Make it, I would make a um, workbench that is about six feet long and about two feet deep. And I would make it have drawers underneath to put stuff in. And I wouldn't, you know, go overboard with the workbench either. I'd make it from two by fours and plywood, nothing fancy, no, not trying to impress anybody. You want to just want to have a place that you can put stuff that's not too massive and huge. And it'll, you'll be able to put it in the drawers out of the way when you're not using it, or you'll be able to take it out of the drawers, bring it with you wherever you go, come back and start work again because you'll have a surface to work on. And then you just go from there. You add, you know, tools as you need them. The one thing I would have to have in my workshop anyway, it would be a table saw that stays there and say a miter saw that stays there. But neither one of those has to be big, you know, professional grade tools to get the job done. So yeah, that's where I would start with a basic workbench, nothing fancy. Main thing is you got some clear area to work. I would not build it into the wall or attach it to the wall. I'm a big believer in having things as freestanding as possible. That way you can move it where you need it if you need to. Because almost certainly, as soon as you attach something to the wall, you find that you have to move it. Anyway, I'm gonna wrap this one up here. If you have questions, leave them in the comments. If you asked a question last time that I didn't answer, leave it again. I just picked out four this time because I'm kind of in a rush. And I'm looking at my thing here and I'm seeing that it's threaded uh, left hand and kind of weird. So I think the best way to fix this is to actually make a cut here with my hacksaw and put a new piece in there, like glue a piece of steel in there as to act as a key that it'll fit into the back of the plane. See what happens when you look at things and you examine them and say, well, how am I going to fix that? And rather than build a whole new piece, which I thought would be interesting, this is a fairly simple fix that can be done fairly quickly. These here are my daddy tools. What are you going to do with them? Well, I ain't building no bookcase. <laughs>